My name is Al Tizon, and I serve on the networking team of the International Fellowship for Mission as Transformation, better known as Infomat. I am passionate, as I'm certain you are, about reconciliation and peacemaking as part of God's mission in the world. Well, today I would like to share a crucial element that needs to be an operation of peace has a chance at all. I wrote a book a few years ago entitled Whole and Reconciled, wherein I discuss six crucial elements of peacemaking as mission. I'm only gonna speak on one of them today. So though there are more crucial elements to talk about, the work of peace and reconciliation cannot do without the one we'll focus on today, namely the crucial element of healing pain. Conflict hurts on so many levels. Deep, long-standing wounds of war between tribes or nations or families require a process of healing, and peacemakers have a role to play in that healing if reconciliation has a chance. Now, the work of healing may sound warm and fuzzy, but the ministry of healing involves excruciating pain. I liken it to fracture resetting a surgical procedure which seeks to fix a once broken bone that set incorrectly over time as it was left to heal by itself. The procedure requires re-breaking the bone, not at all a pleasant thought, but that is exactly what is necessary for the ministry of reconciliation. The problem lies in the fact that we get used to our deformities. We get used to being crippled, disabling us to walk toward the other. We get used to the immobility, the limp, the alienation from those whom we deemed, uh, whom we have deemed as enemies. We convince ourselves that the enmity between us and them is just the way it is. Well, the art of peacemaking attempts to convince the deformed to undergo fractory setting in order to be healed and reconciled in Christ. Deformity describes both sides of any conflict, but not in the same way. Different bones need resetting on the two sides, and relational healing toward peace requires knowing the difference. It requires knowing that the difference does not just mean not the same, though. It also means not equal. As the peace organization Musalaha explains uh, in in the Middle East, in every conflict, one side is more powerful than the other, unquote. At first, I didn't agree with this statement, but as I reflect on the various conflicts in which I have been involved, either as a participant or a mediator, I've experienced the truth of it. Whether a husband having the emotional upper hand in a marital crisis over his wife, or a larger tribe having more say in an organizational or church dispute than a smaller tribe, or a majority culture having the political positioning in a racially charged conflict over a minority culture, the conflict, more often than not, has consistently proven the inequality factor to the extent that peacemakers discern, identify, and acknowledge the power differential they can help guide the two sides in the healing process. With this power differential in mind, peacemakers challenge conflicted parties to play different roles in the healing process. In the case of those who, by their power, have leveraged advantage at the expense of the weaker, the primary message is this, repent. God calls on oppressors, abusers, terrorists, colonizers, rapists, johns, and even unknowingly complicit beneficiaries of unjust systems to repent to turn from their wicked ways and to confess confess their sins to God and to the people they have harmed. Repentance re-breaks the bone of perpetration that malformed the powerful into oppressors, and it resets it toward justice and reconciliation. And contrary to the misconception that repentance is a one-time act, peacemakers urge wrongdoers to assume a lifelong posture of repentance and humility. Peacemakers cannot water down this message. Repentance is the essential part that wrongdoers play in the healing process, not only for the sake of the healing between them and their victims, but also for the sake of their own healing. In light of the power differential, where one party has the upper hand, peacemakers turn into prophets as they call perpetrators to repentance. Rene Padilla pulls no punches when he writes, Quote, in any situation in which power is misused and the powerful take advantage of the weak, God takes the side of the weak. In concrete terms, 
that means God is for the oppressed and against the oppressor, for the exploited and against the exploiter, for the victim and against the victimizer, unquote. Nothing less than heart-wrenching repentance of Ninevite proportions would cause God to relent from meeting out severe judgment on the wicked. When wrongdoers truly do repent, however, God shows mercy, as the story of Jonah clearly demonstrates. As Celestine Musikura, founder and president of the African Leadership and Reconciliation Ministries, reminds us, quote, abusers are victims before they become perpetrators, unquote. In that light, why would God, who desires all to be whole and reconciled, not relent from meeting out judgment upon the truly repentant? With God's judgment lifted, wrongdoers begin to heal, and they position themselves to contribute to the healing process that leads to peace. Repent, shouts the peacemaker prophet to wrongdoers. With equal urgency, they also carry an ultimate message to the wronged, which is this, forgive. Victims of wrongdoing need to forgive for the sake not only of the peace process, um, not only for the peace process, but for the restoration of their own souls. To urge the wrong to forgive, in my kingdom estimation, constitutes the greater ask. Yes, perpetrators will need help, will need the help of God to repent humbly and sincerely, but for the colonized, the abused, the enslaved, the raped, the widowed, and the orphaned. To forgive their victimizers requires a double measure of God's help. We can view it as the need to re-break and reset multiple bones instead of just one. Loved ones murdered, interrogations, imprisonment, torture, the confiscation of property, the betrayal of a spouse, the sexual abuse of a child, and so on. These memories severely cripple the soul, and for some, the body. I think of Ruaka, 25-year-old South Sudanese Christian man who, because of his strong faith in Christ, was, was thrown by a Muslim rival in front of a machine that amputated his right leg and crushed his testicles. When our partners in South Sudan notified us of this tragedy, we responded immediately by sending emergency funds to obtain the urgent medical help needed. After months of life and death struggle, Ruak survived the attempted murder. He is recovering and getting stronger, but his deformity is permanent. The loss of his leg, his manhood, and the possibility of ever fathering a child will remind him always of the crime committed against him. How dare we, as peacemakers, therefore, come to Ruach and his family and tell them to forgive the man who pushed him in front of that machine? How dare we preach forgiveness toward the one who pushed him, and for that matter, all the misguided Muslims in this case, who persecute, maim, and kill Christians, in the name of Allah. Indeed, forgiveness constitutes the harder ask in the peacemaking process. For humanly speaking, revenge makes much, much more sense for Ruach and his family. Retributive justice demands retaliation. The wrongdoer must pay an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a leg for a leg, a testicle for a testicle. The only power capable of breaking this cycle and thus defy the logic of revenge cannot ultimately come from ourselves. The crippling of our souls prevents that. It must come from the Holy Spirit who alone can empower us to forgive. Forgiveness from the heart is a supernatural act, says Musikura. Peacemakers can preach nothing less, must preach nothing less than supernatural forgiveness, hard as it is, because in Christ, God has forgiven us. Musikura, a victim himself of tremendous loss of family members and friends in the Rwandan genocide of 1994, declares, as people who have been forgiven, we have no choice but to forgive also, unquote. Of course, I speak only of the theological angle regarding healing from trauma, which is incomplete in and of itself. As peacemakers, we should also be adept in the ministry of referral and connect the traumatized to qualified professionals who can lead them in deep PTSD, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder therapy, and the like. To forgive does not depend on whether wrongdoers repent, just like to repent, incidentally, does not depend on whether the wronged forgive. The wronged cannot control the response of wrongdoers. If they do not repent, then forgiveness becomes more about the victim's liberation 
They have, by the posture of forgiveness, freed themselves from tortured memories. This is not insignificant, though admittedly, without the repentance of the wrongdoer, reconciliation cannot happen. But neither can it happen if the wronged do not forgive. For the sake of their own healing and for the possibility of reconciliation, therefore, peacemakers urge victims of wrongdoing to claim their identity in the crucified and risen Jesus and to extend by the power of the Spirit the miraculous hand of forgiveness. Peacemakers call victimizers to repent, they call victims to forgive, and then at some point they call both victim and victimizer to lament and to lament together. Lament in the Bible, writes Sung Chan Ra, is a liturgical response to the reality of suffering and engages in God, engages God in the context of pain and trouble. It refers to a passionate expression of deep sorrow, often accompanied by unabashed complaining, loud wailing, deep groaning, and seething words against unjust systems, cruel regimes, great loss of life, crimes against humanity, and the seeming absence of God, even as it assumes that hope can be found only in God. This is lament. Several years ago, I was asked to open a community development consultation in South Africa to set the tone for a week of partnership building presentations and activities. At the risk of beginning the event with a downer, I led the participants comprised of both African and North American Christian workers in a time of communal lament didn't feel right to me in a gathering on partnership and economic de development to gloss over the history of colonialism and the part that the Western church played in it and which undoubtedly the African participants continue to experience in one form or another. I facilitated a group recitation of several general post-colonial laments. Then afterwards, I encouraged anyone and everyone to cry out with laments specific to their contexts. Though there wasn't much crying out, almost everyone spoke. In each other's hearing, participants shared honestly and sincerely. While most of the Africans shared the pain of suffering losses and indignities related to the colonial spirit, past and present, those from North America confessed varying degrees of participation in condescending and paternalistic attitudes and or behaviors. Communal lament created a space right for repentance and forgiveness. And so when it felt right to cap the time, we recited together, have mercy on us, O Lord, empower us to sin no more and to champion the justice and peace of the gospel. Communal lament has a powerful role to play in the healing process that leads to peace as it provides the opportunity to repent and forgive and to come before God together with both honesty and hope. Peacemakers are those who can lead the wrongdoer to repent, the wronged to forgive, and all to lament the violence and bloodshed of the past in order to move from the past into present peace and ultimately to God's future, where we will all experience the reconciliation of all things in Christ. Thank you. <laughs>